Welcome to the Databricks Skill Builder Series. We're glad you're here. Uh, so just like Mandy talked about, um, my name is Jeffrey Anor. Um, I am a solution architect within the manufacturing vertical here at Databricks. And I've been here a little bit over a year and a half. And I am one of the members of the IoT SME group that we have here at Databricks. Um, and to give some background about the IoT SME group, um, it's just a pretty, I'd say a small cohort of people, but you know, we are highly skilled in things like industrial equipment data capture, um, industrial IoT use cases, which pretty much spans across every vertical. So you could think of you know, uh, streaming use cases with finance, in some cases maybe IoT, uh, a lot of manufacturing use cases, retail, um, healthcare, um, and even some medical device manufacturing use cases all fall within within uh, SME group. So um, the only thing that I'll encourage folks to do is if you have any uh, use case that it's mostly around uh, streaming, but a little bit more dedicated to you know devices, equipment, and some some advanced machine learning use cases like you know computer vision. Um, audio recognition and things like that. Uh, we have SME members within that group that uh, showcase some of these use cases on a daily basis. So it would be great to you know um, leverage some of these expertise. Um, but today, what I'm here to talk about is you know the entire concept of tiny machine learning um, and you know how tiny machine learning actually came about. It's contest within IoT. And some of the use cases that we've actually seen customers leverage, you know, this whole this entire concept of tiny machine learning for. Um, we will talk briefly about, you know, uh, the, the difference between regular machine learning and tiny machine learning. But we then also dive into um, how you can actually leverage Databricks for some of these tiny machine learning use cases. And then from there, um, we'll dive into, you know, obviously our Databricks platform. I'll showcase how you could use PyTorch to easily quantize a model, which is an example of, you know, um, um, moving a model from like a higher compute state to a small compute state. And then finally, we will dive into um, all the different modes of deployment. Um, so basically how you could take these models from Databricks and then put them on, you know, things like microcontrollers or even microprocessors to then uh, run your inference. In. So, you know, to dive in, I know I briefly touched on the content, but to dive in, what is tiny machine learning and, you know, why, why is this even important, right? I know many of you would know about the entire concept of machine learning. You're basically giving computers some type of rudimentary tasks. Um, it could be, you know, recognizing that some input of data and then giving an output back. These data could be in the form of, you know, the, the structured data it could be semi-structured like we all talked about and then unstructured. Um, for the context of tiny machine learning, it's mostly focused on, you know, the concept of, say, unstructured data. So when you think about unstructured data, you can think about this in the context of um, audio and images, right? And the main uh, use case here is how can we actually take, you know, these models that in most cases require higher compute to train and also higher compute to run inference in, and then, um, you know, basically unlock a whole new use case around them. And this use case, by this new use case, what I basically mean is push these models closer to where data is being generated. So an example here would be, you know, if you have a microphone um, attached to a small microcontroller, microprocessor, why do you need to, you know, capture all these audio files, ship them to the cloud before you could, you know, basically be able to, to run inferencing with that data set that you've achieved. And in most cases, you need some level of bidirectional communication. So once you ship these data sets, you know, from the microphone to the cloud and run inference, and you might need to take some type of action on the device, right? So you need to set, send these inference data back to, to, uh, to the microphone for, then, for it to take some particular type of action. Um, in the process of doing all of these, um, you know, comes uh, the, the, the issue of latency, right? So shipping the data from the edge device to the cloud, so shipping data across network, um, that introduces some type of latency. Running your inference in the cloud, even though you might have all the compute available, might introduce some type of latency. And then also shipping the data back to the device, uh, to the actual, you know, edge device would also introduce some type of latency. So the whole concept around tiny machine learning is how do we actually shrink these gigantic models that we actually train on the cloud to enable them to basically run anywhere? And by running anywhere, you would see here that you know we are talking about a few of the the advantages that TinyML actually um, unlocks. So, you know, tighter integration with 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 field devices, 
basically creating a, a seamless um, um, you know, link bidirectionally that would allow you to, if you are a little bit advanced, do your own device training, ship that uh, model back into the cloud uh, that is called federated learning. Um, or in some cases, you know, train your model in the cloud and easily deploy these, these models anywhere. And by deployment, what, I be, what it, that basically means is that, you know, you can actually deploy these models since they're very small in, in, in nature to very, very low power device and even constrained device, devices that are very, very constrained on, on things like network bandwidths and, 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 and other things. So when you actually look at the key differences between, you know, tiny ML and traditional ML, um, there are a few things that, that basically stand out, right? So traditional ML is basically giving us capabilities to actually expand uh, with unlimited compute, in, in most cases, to expand the scope of how much input data we could feed into, you know, these models to make, basically make them um, um, accurate. Tiny ML focuses on the capabilities of, of these models being able to basically run anywhere. And by, by running anywhere, again, I mean, you know, low powered uh, devices, embedded systems, and with these things, you can basically think of things like, you know, remote um, uh, security cameras that can actually be based, like, you know, somewhere like out, say, in the woods and, and, and things like that. When it comes to um, hardware uh, required for training, uh, with TinyML, since you actually focused on training small uh, models, in most cases, you actually require a small set of hardware um, to train these models. And, but then there are also, you know, some uh, trade-offs that you, you actually do, do incur, which we'll talk about. Uh, when it comes to power consumption, you know, with, with, with a cloud, you have unlimited computer and basically unlimited power. So you could basically, you know, train these models as big as you want. But that is also not the case for tiny machine learning. Um, again, network bandwidth, you know, um, pretty, pretty small uh, network bandwidth, bandwidth needed for tiny machine learning use cases. But when you think about deployment, like you can basically deploy all these models anywhere. So as it stands, you can still take a mobile net, you know, uh, uh, model or even a, 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 a yellow model and basically deploy that on, on, on GP, uh, GPU like hardware at, at the edge. But tiny ML basically focuses on, you know, a stream, a, a, a very, very extreme uh, low part compute devices. So you can think of microcontrollers that have a total compute bandwidth of, of say about like two megabits of flash memory. Um, so these are the type of devices that tiny ML basically targets. Whilst when you know traditional ML, you could do them on things like you know uh, Nvidia like GPUs and and other things like that. So, uh, looking at some of the use cases that Tiny ML has basically um, you know started, I'd say opening the the, the market to. Uh, you could think of traditionally you could still do things like defect detection or you know um, um, say highly advanced uh, monitoring processes within manufacturing where you, you can have high speed embedded cameras, you know, highly proprietary, specifically designed for um, a, sp a specific like use case within a plant. Um, in most cases, these obviously cost a lot of money. Uh, and, you know, some plants are really sometimes willing not to invest this type of money because it, they really do not even have any capabilities of actually diving into the camera, even updating these models when their products change, right? Uh, but one of the use cases that uh, Tiny ML has basically been uh, enabling is defect detection by basically leveraging um, any type of microcontroller, microprocessor, even a Raspberry Pi um, uh, to, to do. In most cases, all you need to do is leverage, um, you can leverage our platform uh, to obviously capture some images, you know, um, do some image tagging, um, use any type, any of the open source, say, neural net models that are available to train your model. Um, and then, you know, leverage, leverage any of the, the quantization uh, techniques that would allow you to compress your model. Another thing too is predictive maintenance. Uh, traditionally with predictive maintenance, you know, you would have some type of telemetry data. You would have some type of maintenance log data. You know, you might do some type of data shift with your target variable to see if your telemetry data can help you predict in advance, like if your equipment might fail, right? But some use cases that TinyML is basically enabling is, you know, by buying very, very cheap uh, computer uh, uh, micro, uh, controller microprocessor hardware. In some cases, about like $6. Some of these things can come embedded with accelerometers and gyrometers. So you can basically place them on any equipment that you, you basically want to monitor um, instead of actually waiting for telematics data, which basically happens, you know, um, 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 say after certain events have occurred. 
um, you can actually use some of these accelerometers and gyrometers to basically measure things like vibration, which takes you to the core of the actual problem. So you can get, you know, issues happening with happening with, with your motors and some of your hardware within, say in some cases like microsecond level. And then the final use case that um, I want to talk about here is occupancy detection. So, you know, um, like many of you would know, there's a huge motion around folks returning back to the office. Um, in most cases, you know, you need some type of, you know, um, either low power motion detector sensor or using some type of um, embedded camera, which, you know, might not be capturing images of people, right? And in most cases, you need to run these inferences at the edge and then ship your insights or your analytics back into the cloud. And that is one of the, the, the use cases that uh, TinyML has been um, enabling, basically capturing the images, giving you, um, you know, account of, say, the objects that you've actually detected, uh, shipping those um, counts or insights back into the cloud and basically discarding the images. That way you're not shipping any proprietary information back into the cloud. So the next section that I'll dive into is TinyML and Databricks, right? And how does an end-to-end -end, um, um, architecture, say like this, looks like on Databricks? Um, that to the right, you would see that it actually includes some, um, I would say, companies that are not partners yet. But if you're thinking about ways to actually, or if your customer has ways where they've actually built their own, you know, kind of like edge gateway, you can actually tag that onto this architecture that we have. Um, but you know, looking at it from the left to the right, you basically have a platform capabilities like auto loader and structured streaming that allows you to bring in, you know, things like images and audio files, right, and even videos. So you can leverage those functionalities to bring in your data set. You could bring in, say, another batch data set if you want to do your, your um, IT and then your um, operational telematics data conversion. You can bring in data from your ERP systems and then, you know, use our ingestion and then our transformation features to basically co-join these data sets to create your um, aggregated data set uh, for your models like input. So that part, you know, a lot of us on next call should uh, be familiar with. The next part is what are the functionalities that you can actually leverage on our platform to basically, um, you know, um, enable use cases or even compress your model to make them tiny. Um, again, um, in most cases, especially with PyTorch, it actually works fully with MLflow, um, and I'll, sh I'll show an example. What you basically do is you follow your entire like training um, um, scheme or your tra entire training architecture, where you you know you bring in your data set. You could use any of these like open um, uh, models to basically uh, run over your data set to generate some features. I mean, in our case, we use PyTorch uh, Vision. Once you've actually used, you know any of these feature structures to extract your features, you then define uh, the type of model that you, you would want to build. Um, here, you could use Hyperop, you could use Horovit for uh, distributed training. But then after your model is actually done um, you know, training, uh, there are a few ways that you can actually um, 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 uh, leverage, which are all open source to actually uh, to compress your model or quantize your model. In the example that I'll show, I'll show um, an example called post-training quantization where you basically can grab an existing model that a customer has. And, and this is also like really helpful for use cases where your customer might say, oh, maybe I'm serving a model with Databricks, you know, serverless serving. It's not really giving me the performance that I'm looking for and things like that. Um, what you basically do is you grab this uh, model, you know, you run some type of quantization methodology on it. And I'll explain like, you know, the entire concept of quantization. And then uh, you can then, basically use MLflow to save the, 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 the output results of that quantized model. And um, the key output that you basically see is that the size of the model in most cases would reduce by, I'd say like three quarters. Um, and um, when you also like, you know, do things like test for accuracy, you might take a hit, but it's, it's still like pretty minimal. So you, you would then have to do the, that trade-off analysis. Well, after you've quantized your model, the next step that you have to do is basically deploy your model to the edge. Um, currently, as it stands, we have three different ways. Um, it all depends on the type of device that you're running, uh, basically, which would also like go over. Uh, final thing that I'll talk about before we dive into the demo will be quantization. Um, what well, quantization with you know neural net models basically is. is it's it's a it basically issue an opportunity to actually reduce the the precision numbers right um, that are used to represent your model's parameters. So, 
you know, when you have um, a neural net, in most cases, you you know, you have your, your, your weights, which would basically get computed plus some BIOS, plus some BIOS, right, to help give you um, a layer. Most of these weights, when they're computed, they're completed, they're computed in, in floats, uh, which are 32 bits. Um, in this case, quantization is basically helping you in particular, like bend those, those numbers. So, you know, if you have float numbers, in most cases, you can actually convert those floats to actual, actual integers. Um, that's, you know, converting from a 32 bit to an 8 bit helps you save three quarters of your model, like right there and then. Uh, but then there are two ways to actually do that. Uh, one of the ways is, you know, after you've actually built uh, your neural net architecture with its layers, you then go in and say, okay, basically like, you know, do my quantization, like after the model's training. Um, when you take this methodology, you actually do take some type of performance hit. Um, in most cases, about like one to 2%. It all depends on your use case and the type of trade-off that you'd like to do. Um, the other form is also using, you know, quant well, quantization like aware training, where as your neural net layers are basically being built, right? You're actually actually quanti uh, quantizing your, your layers as these um, um, layers are basically being built. Uh, the benefit here is that your training might uh, take a little bit longer to, to complete, um, but then you do still somewhat get um, a little bit of a better performance than like doing post, post training quantization while you're actually looking back at your entire, the entire formula that goes into all your layers and basically slashing um, all your flow points uh, to into this. So uh, that's basically the entire concept of this. Um, there are multiple ways that you can also, you know, take a look um, at your neural net like architecture. We do have some um, links here um, in the resources that can show you how you can visu visualize, you know, um, neural net architectures. And basically that should also give you certain ideas about, you know, how best you can quantize them and different um, optimization techniques that you could take to uh, basically ensure that, you know, your model is, is being optimized for um, um, constraint devices and, and, and um, constraint resource hard hardware. Um, any questions here before I dive into the example demo notebook? Let me see if there are any questions here in the chat. I don't see any yet, but again, if anyone has questions, please use the Q&A box. Awesome. So um, in this particular demo, let me see if this thing shows up. Yeah, so it showed up. In this particular demo, um, what the example that we basically use is we would use um, this computer vision demo um, that basically looks at predicting defects um, when it comes to you know uh, printed circuit boards. Um, let me scroll up to this notebook. When we talk about printed circuit boards, um, this is what we are basically looking at. So let me make this bigger. Yep. So in our case, we have a board. Um, it has, you know, a few things like resistors on top of them, but it has these top, uh, uh, four top wires that it actually uses for a connection, right? And then uh, one of the things that we, we can see here is if we look at, um, and bear with me, if we look at the ones with a uh, defect label, which would be uh, one, we would see examples of it showing defects. Yep. So here, you here. This is this is a perfect example. You would see that you know the the connection the connecting like you know wires are not that straight. Um, some of them are a little bit taped together. Uh, some of them do have some items on top of it. Um, so what we are basically doing in this particular case is, you know, we've captured all these data sets. All we want to do is we want to feed this into, um, a, a, you know, PyTorch uh, vision model and it, have it help us extract features. And then we use Dataverse to train a model. And after we train a model, we'll go through the entire process of, have, uh, you know, quantizing the model um, post training. And then after we train a model, we'll look at the different sizes that we get with ML flow. So um, a lot of these things, I probably would not go through them because, you know, this image classification accelerator is available for anyone. Um, but I could talk about leverages things like Predastorm, uh, Torch Vision, you know, Hyperop, and, and all those features that we all should be familiar with.
So again, create our train test data set. Uh, we use Predestone to load in our images. We start defining our modules, what you know we want um, basically uh, about our inference latency to look like. Um, this is the part where we actually do the extraction of features uh, from the data set that we feed it using uh, you know, PyTorch Vision. So we have that, so our road transformation, transformation spec to get our features. These are the, the feature sets that we get from, you know, running Torch Vision on top of the images that I basically showed. Uh, so here you see like, you know, it's, it's tends to basically represent it itself. We define what training the single epoch looks like. We also define our evaluation criteria. In this case, we'll, we'll mostly just log um, our F1 score, um, our accuracy and also our training loss. Finally define what our train and evaluate would look like. And this is what we actually call our train. So, you know, when we call in our train and evaluate, we get a, a return of the model, the loss, the accuracy, and the F1. But after we get the model, um, what we would then do here is we would actually use uh, PyTorch, uh, PyTorch quantization model to quantize our model. In this case, we are basically just telling it to use, you know, uh, PyTorch um, in, intake conversion to convert all our float points uh, with regards to our weights to, to into this. Then after we do that, we then use you know, MLflow's PyTorch module to basically log in the quantized model that we did. So we basically log in two models just to you know, see the comparison. And the final thing we do is, you know, we just give it our run. And then we start, we tell uh, MLflow to you know, basically do two uh, uh, maximum evaluations and then give us the, the output runs. So here we would have our experiment logged in. Uh, what I'll then do is I'll go to our MLflow experiment. So let's see. Yep, it looks like these two things were complete. So we have two experiments here. One of them is about 98.2, the other is 98.7. Let's look at the one that's 98.7. Uh, we have our parameters, we have our metrics, we have But down here, you see that we have two models, right? When we look at these two models, we have the actual model itself before quantization and then the model after quantization. And the key thing that I want us to look at here would be the size of the model. So after quantization, the model was 165 megabytes. And before quantization, it was 327. So in our particular case, we've been able to actually shrink down this model. So if we're running something like, you know, a Raspberry Pi Zero or something like that, that maybe give us like, you know, half a gigabyte of, of RAM, um, what, what we can then do is just by, you know, taking this very, very easy approach of quantization, even without visualizing our, our new one that's like architecture, even taking together like, you know, more aggressive like quantization methods, we've been able to cut down the size of this model um, in half. So we can then, you know, proceed and, Similarly, register this model um, and then use it, you know, across any of our, our, our model serving or our inferencing capabilities. Awesome. Any questions on that uh, before we finally dive into the different modes for deployment? Nope, still good. I will right, we'll go ahead and share again. Yeah. So, you know, now that you've had an understanding of what the entire concept of tiny machine learning is, um, how you could basically use, you know, very basic quantization methods to essentially like, you know, uh, to strip the, the size of your model in half. Well, what, what, what do I get to do with these models, right? What if my use case actually requires me to deploy this thing or maybe, um, say, you know, uh, an, 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 an Arduino device or say a Raspberry Pi device, or even in some cases, you know, an NVIDIA-like device, which has uh, an embedded camera on top of it. How do I take these defects models, say, even deploy them on my manufacturing shop floor? Well, there are multiple ways to do that. Um, and I, when we started, like, you know, this entire presentation, I touched on, um, um, I touched briefly on, on the two, two modes of deployments. So the first thing being cloud deployment, uh, with cloud deployment, you know, you have a few advantages. You have elastic compute. So 
you know, in the cloud, obviously everything is muted. So, you know, you can procure more resources, use it for your workloads and basically let go of those resources, right? When it comes to inferencing, um, especially with the database platform, you could do batch, you could do streaming, you could do rest. Uh, but when you think of use cases, like say having a conveyor belt, right? Where things are you know, constantly being produced on a microsecond level and these things are basically like passing through the system, uh, you, you might want a way to, you know, do things like flag your, 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 your defect detection models, like, you know, a little bit more frequently than, than doing a batch. Um, when it comes to deployment, you know, you have things like cloud working anywhere where you have reliable internet connection. So example, if you want to send binaries of images through REST uh, to a Databricks serverless um, instance to get results, that's 100% possible. But you know you need high network like for for these type of use cases, and that also have some high latency uh, that comes with it. But when it comes to edge deployment, um, you know there are a few things that you have to think about. Since these models are, are are running locally, you have to really think about things like you know the compute limitations that you have. So part of that reason is you know actually taking your model through something like you know quantization to actually ensure that. The, the size is being reduced and these models can at least still run optim, um, optimally and give you the performance that you're looking for. When it comes to streaming, um, since you're doing this locally on the device, um, you know, streaming, it's, 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 it's as close to real time as you can ever get. And then you also have things like, you know, um, being able to actually leverage uh, uh, REST API functionalities. But that depends on the actual device having you know, um, um, a Wi-Fi a Wi-Fi module, or even having access to you know um, a cellular like uh, 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 data um, network, it can actually run on very very um, 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 uh, low bandwidth devices, such as since it has uh, you know close to zero latency. This is basically running everything locally. Uh, locally, you know, you can run your inference and then buffer your results in some cases where the network is not available at all, and then ship them out when when network becomes available. And uh, you know, deployment mode works best for um, constrained use cases. So when it comes to things like you know, high frequency uh, detection of of things, tiny ML, um, and, and edge deployment like works best. Uh, when it comes to you know, deploying um, models over the air to devices in say in in, in the wild, uh, tiny ML and, and and also edge deployment actually works best. But when it comes to uh, the other different options that you have, um, especially leveraging our platform um, to deploy these models, right? Um, obviously with cloud, like many of you would know, you, you can actually leverage you know, the Databricks um, um, REST API uh, serverless serving. That, that is an option. Um, you can also do things like you know, uh, batch and um, even in some cases like uh, move models from a platform using ML flow into things like Azure ML or SageMaker to set up your models. Um, when it comes to edge deployment, um, currently as it stands, there are two options. The first option is containerization. So the way that this mostly works is, you know, you would register your model, you go through the entire um, um, ML ops like motion that we have on our platform, you register your model, you can put a webhook on top of it. Um, and then this webhook would eventually call some type of CI/CD process. So when it calls a CI/CD process, it would use, you know, your, your, you use your ML flow to authenticate. After you use your ML flow to authenticate, you would then um, use the API to search for a run or uh, a model um, registered in a state that you, you're looking for. You can then pull this model down, use ML flow Docker, um, Docker build to help you build a Docker file. And then this Docker file can get built into um, either Cloud Container Registry or even open source Docker. Once it gets built into um, your Cloud Container Registry or open source Docker. Um, on your device, what you basically would have to do is, you know, when you deploy these um, um, images as, as either pods or, or modules, the only thing you have, the only option that you have to do is allow, give it the option to actually do rolling updates. And what would basically happen is that, you know, as soon as your, your models are registered on the database platform, the web would gets triggered, kicks off a CI CD process. Um, a new image of your repository of your you know model or your code base gets built, pushed into Docker, and then your device is basically going to pull these down. Um, and it's also a very very similar concept for if you want to do over the air updates, maybe through things like REST, uh, where you can have a dedicated route. You know, you ship packets of data, you make a call to it, and then that call will basically trigger a few um, uh, workflows, which are then uh, start pulling in, in, in a new Docker image. Um, the next option that you have is actually leveraging the MLflow client 
Um, so some of these uh, devices, even though they're constrained um, or, you know, either through resources or where they're based, um, have started actually being able to like run um, embedded like Linux. So what embedded Linux basically means that, you know, they can also run Python. So basically everything that you can do in the cloud on your computer, um, these devices can also do the same. Um, so in that particular case, you know, you can, on your device, set up some type of um, edge agent script. And what this edge agent script basically does is it would install MLflow. After it installs MLflow, it basically authenticate to your database platform um, to have access to your, your MLflow experiments and also your, your model repository. And then from there, you know, you can basically script this in any way that you want. Uh, one of the ways is one of the ways is basically putting this on a schedule, having that reach out to uh, your experiment or your models, um, you know, at any given point in time, and then pulling, say, the the latest experiment, just matching a set of criteria. Um, another option too would be, you know, you use WebLoops on our platform to do your model propagation. Um, whenever that model gets registered, it can also like make a call to your device server. And then tell it to actually kick the workflow uh, with the edge agent that basically comes onto uh, your database platform to then pull in data. Um, so down here we have a few more information about um, how Databricks basically supports real-time production workloads. Um, this is mostly for for customers that have an interest in, you know, actually maybe doing same things on, on their local devices, but still having the option or, or the capability to ship some data back to, to Databricks for, for a longer time, like inference and um, to, through our REST API. And then this, these uh, few slides basically dive a little bit more deep, deeper into the architecture. So this is the workflow for you know, what I talked about with devices that actually have capabilities to actually run embedded Linux. Um, you know, in that case, um, you authenticate on that device with some type of um, agent script that would, you know, gets rebooted, similar to a firmware, uh, gets rebooted every time the, the device gets restarted. You know, this, our code base knows how to authenticate to MLflow to your Dataverse workspace. It knows, based on the criteria that you've given it, you know, the type of model to search for, it knows how to download this and basically um, replace that with the existing model that, that would be available. When you think about deployment through containers, um, we actually do have a solution accelerator on this um, one coming out, uh, mostly based um, on Azure, uh, since we do have a lot of manufacturing customers based on Azure. Uh, but the workflow is actually pretty straightforward. Um, you know, you, you go through the entire model training phase. Then after the model training upon upon some a model registration or you know a request uh, to, to transition made uh, be, be be made, you know. A webhook would then trigger a set of DevOps, I say um, pipelines, which would basically take the model name, um, you know, search search your your MLflow experiments is based on a criteria that has been given, and then build out a Docker container and register that within Azure Container Registry, uh, where you have things like you know Azure IoT heads basically picking up the new um, image that has been created by the 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 by Azure Container Registry deploying that onto your device, um, and then eventually like doing that rolling updates for you. And I think it should be out maybe in the next couple of weeks. And, um, yeah. So that's, that's pretty much it. Um, if you're looking for more information, uh, this slide should actually be made available. Uh, if you search through the IOC Slack channel, uh, you should see of uh, you know different versions of these slides and it should contain um a lot of the information that the, a lot of the information that i talked about today so we got tensorflow light uh tensorflow light they were the originators of the entire tiny ml concept um obviously you know we have um, a data and ai summit talk here uh but a few other like startup companies so edge impulse new in um, these are platforms that allow you to, to seamlessly you know collect data uh train models and then deploy these models back into your devices and then um, a few uh, Medium articles that talks about the entire concept of tiny machine learning. So uh, that's pretty much all I had for today. You have any questions in the chat?
Hey, Jeffrey. I'm not seeing any questions in the chat. Just a heads up. Awesome. Awesome. Um, also, if you have any IoT, um, you know, use cases or opportunities or, you know, need somebody to talk to your customer, um, just ping us in a Slack channel or, you know, ping me directly. Let us know and we'll be super happy to help. Awesome. Thanks, everyone.